So Kathleen, you're a professor of philosophy at the University of Sussex. You're well known for your writings on trans activism, and you're the author of a new book called Material Girls. Welcome. Thank you. So the reason we're having this conversation now is because over the last few days, there have been a few interesting developments in the kind of debate around trans activism and the coverage in the media. And it's something I've been looking at keenly for quite a long time, in particular, Jester Walls. Um, she is an artist who initially the Royal Academy said she had done this blog post that they considered transphobic. They were taking her art out. And then yesterday they changed their minds and basically issued an apology to, to Jess, mm -hmm. which is the first time I've seen a big public body kind of stand up against pressure where we've all seen sort of cancellations. We've all seen kind of this whole com conversation going on for quite a long time. And that felt quite significant. Then there was also the Laurel Hubbard um, qualifying for the Olympics, a, a trans athlete, trans uh, weightlifter, and the Guardian of all places had a, a very full-throated defense of women's sport. Those two things together and just this sort of general sense over the last few months, I guess, particularly in the UK, felt to me like the conversation was changing a little bit. And I'd love to go into a little bit of the history of that and kind of your take on it as someone who's been kind of deeply immersed in this conversation for a long time. Maybe let's just start with, uh, yeah, just getting a kind of situational report. Where do you think we're at right now with, uh, am I right to think that things are shifting or the conversation is starting to change? I think so. I mean, I can be pe more pessimistic and more optimistic depending on the day, but um I think it's true to say that, for instance, that Guardian article that you mentioned um, was pretty unthinkable two years ago, even though the same issues were arising within sport. Um, and I've also been interviewed by The Guardian, actually, for my book, which um, was pretty amazing. And I basically stated my views and they printed them <laughs> and they didn't editorialise there particularly which is the other thing I mean there's a lot of um in the past the the left-wing press in Britain has um presented the issues so tendentiously so for instance people like me are always described as anti-trans which is not true at all um and so I, I've, I've seen less of that there's still you know there's still quite a long way to go in terms of this issue being properly um explored in the media across the board, I think. Just for the record, do you want to state what your what your views are? Yes, well, my views are that um, people cannot change sex, uh, that sex is lifelong, uh, that an inner feeling of gender identity um, is not something everyone has. And, and when you do have it, it doesn't necessarily automatically determine your rights to enter certain spaces or to have certain resources. Um, I think that the mantra, I mean, this is, this is the bit that's hardest for people to swallow, but I'll just say it. I think that the mantra that we are being urged to adopt that trans women are women and trans men are men is not literally true. I think it's a benevolent fiction that we, many of us think we were adopting for good reasons, but it wasn't thought through how this would affect when taken literally um, things like women only spaces, women only sport, uh, women's sports teams and so on. So um, I've written a book to try and uh, to explain the philosophical underpinnings of what I think. Um, and, and that's that book you referred to. And yes, it's, it's gone down quite badly <laughs> in some, some areas. But I mean, I really am trying to make the intellectual case for what I think. And I mean, my interest in this really as a journalist has been, I've got a few friends who made documentaries about this and were just shocked at, like, these are people who've made documentaries about terrorism. They've made documentaries, they've, they've, they've been in Syria, some of them. And then they turned to this topic, made a documentary that, looked to me and looked to everyone like it was completely balanced. It was trying to show both sides of the story and then were absolutely amazed by the the kind of the vitriol that came their way and were kind of 
in a way slightly radicalized by the experience. And for me, the, 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 the interesting thing is that it seems quite clear that there is a conversation to be had about trans people being able to live lives of dignity and being able to live lives as they wish. And there is clearly, as far as I think most people can see, there's, there's, there is a, a tension there between, as you said, women-only spaces that has to be explored. And that conversation, I think, if we believe in dialogue and we believe in kind of healthy conversation, has to happen. And the fact that that conversation is shut down by claims of even having this conversation is literal violence, for example, is where, where I start to get interested in the topic and sort of it starts to, it starts to become... Yeah, it, it 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 treads on my territory as a journalist, I guess, at that point. Yeah. Well, I actually think that it's um, the reason that it's uh, so toxic and uh, people seem unable to communicate against their differences is partly a product of what I referred to, which is that um, it's a fiction. I think most people do not believe that people can change sex. I don't. I just don't think that. Um, the belief that people can change sex has spread across the population. I believe that people are immersing themselves in a fiction. My background is in philosophy of fiction. It's a perfectly natural activity. We do it all the time when we get involved in um, dramas or novels or, you know, we immerse ourselves imaginatively and we commit. And I think what, you know, nobody who's immersed in a fiction wants to be reminded it's a fiction, you know, and it's no, we're no longer seeking truth. We're seeking realism. We're seeking aesthetic realism effectively. Um, and uh, it's become the view of the left that we have to maintain this fiction at all costs um, because it will harm vulnerable trans people if we drop it. And actually, I don't think that's true. I know lots of trans people who disagree with that too. So we're not arguing about, it's, it, we need to be clear that we're not arguing about how people live their lives, uh, how they present, um, what surgery they have even to their bodies if they're adults. We're arguing about this new, relatively new concept of an inner gender identity, this thing that supposedly you can't even see from someone's presentation. It's not necessarily expressed in hormone taking or surgery or how you dress. It's an inner state. And that's the state that's being put in laws and policies, both in the UK and the US. So that's really where all the clashes start to happen. Um, and, and I wouldn't be doing any of this had that not been um, pushed for. So, you know, this is not an abstract conversation and we're not doing it for fun. Um, we're trying, we're arguing for things that make concrete differences to people's lives. Yeah, I mean, why why are you passionate about this? How does it affect you? Well, I'm, I'm a woman <laughs> and I'm a woman in a, um, a, left, a relatively progressive university and generally, you know, I'm quite middle-class British sort of a person who therefore... Um, you know, that in my profession, the philosophy, the women, the Society for Women in Philosophy now is open to anyone who identifies as a woman. All the public spaces in my university are open, all the women's ones are open to anyone who identifies as a woman. So this has been brought in in many, many areas of my life. It's visible to me. I'm also um, gay. According to the new identity ideologues, uh, being a lesbian is now to be understood in terms of having a female gender identity, being attracted to those with a female gender identity. So according to the new orthodoxy, males, I would call them heterosexual males, can be lesbians if they have female gender identities. Now that's may sound bizarre, but it's actually been adopted by big organizations like Stonewall, like GLAAD, who ostensibly are there to defend gay rights. And there is an obvious tension there too. So both as a woman, as a, a lesbian, and as a philosopher, watching my profession just look over there <laughs> when this is all coming down and just going absolutely deathly quiet um, in a very suspicious way, considering they will talk, you know, argue about anything else. I am, I'm involved. Yeah. And what do you make of the Jester Wiles case? Because there's a lot of what I see um, on one side is a lot of catastrophizing about this, kind of talking about kind of the woke takeover and the, the trans activist takeover. And some people saying, I've heard people say that institutions are completely powerless to resist this kind of ideology. 
And yet what I'm seeing, particularly in the UK, is we saw the Royal Academy turn around. We're seeing a lot of organizations now leaving the Stonewall diversity scheme for similar reasons. Uh, Stonewall basically insisting on, on, on a kind of very narrow form of um, what I'd call gender identity dogma in, in organizations. And a lot of organizations are now leaving that. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in whether we can kind of push back against the kind of outrage porn catastrophization and say, well, how are things shifted? Public opinion seems to be shifting. And yeah, yeah. what do you make of the Jester Wiles case, for example? Well, I mean, I don't have any intimate background knowledge of that case, so I can only surmise um, from looking at it from the outside. But what I imagine happened um, is that the decision was made at a relatively low level of organization in the, in the institution. Um, and then the fuss happened and luckily um, columnists, Times columnists like Janice Turner, for instance, um, and Suzanne Moore on her blog, who's a former Guardian journalist, now a Telegraph, Telegraph journalist, they picked it up. And that caused enough kerfuffle for the high echelons of the Royal Academy to notice and to step in with all their PR expertise and presumably some shock that this had happened, I imagine, because I don't, th what I do think is, um, the panic gets wrong is the idea that these institutions are homogenous entities um, that really have that much of a grip on what happens in their own institutions. And quite often these, these sort of cancellings happen because um, a relatively junior um, gender studies graduate who's in charge of the Twitter feed <laughs> says something quite pompous about, you know, a particular person or an institution or says, you know, we won't be stocking that in our shop anymore or whatever. And I don't think that the people in charge necessarily even know that that's happening. So one thing that definitely is to me becoming clearer, if I was a boss of a big institution, I would get a handle on, on PR and social media, you know, and I would say, I would lay out quite clear guidelines for people as to what they may or may not say on behalf of their own institution. But um, it is definitely, it's it's definitely re encouraging. And that statement they put out, they even said something like, freedom of expression is a core value for the Royal Academy, which I thought was pretty amazing to see that stated so clearly. But I do also, um, you know, I don't know much about the Royal Academy background, but it's called the Royal Academy. So it strikes me as probably a relatively conservative institution in many ways perhaps with a sort of woke uh, junior faction who are there to kind of bring in the kids, but and that's often the sort of where the tensions arise. Um, so great that they've done that, but we also need to see the ICA or the Tate, or, you know, we need to see these other more sort of left-wing, um, I don't know if they're left-wing, but they present themselves much more as progressive. The British Film Institute has a terrible record on this. Um, they've actually chucked uh, women wearing T-shirts that say woman, adult, human, female. They've chucked those out of their cafe before, you know, uh, and show no remorse as, I, as, I, as far as I know. As far as I know, I haven't followed that up. So I think um, there's still a lot of work to be done. But what is reassuring is that the grown-ups seem to be entering the room a bit more. And I really think a lot of this has just got the purchase it has because it's um, the senior managers in most institutions have outsourced their consciences to Stonewall, who has given them all this kind of quasi-legal advice, um, and to their junior members who seem very well-intentioned and very progressive and clearly want to do the right thing. So you think, well, they must know what they're doing, we'll just leave them to it. But they don't always know what they're doing, I think. <laughs> and knowing that we have quite a um, large American contingent watching our uh, stuff, I'm really fascinated by the difference in the debate in the UK versus the, the US mm -hmm. and how from the US, Britain is kind of seen as turf island in some, in some places. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of a few interesting things that happened that kind of showed the difference. There was a famous sort of Guardian editorial a while ago, I think maybe two years, three years ago, that where well, the Guardian had a, a, what I would consider a very sort of mild, um, straight down the line editorial that said, we're 
entirely pro-trans rights, but we have to understand that there, is, there are some balances with women's rights. And that's basically all it said. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of, and that was obviously written in the UK, but then a lot of the Guardian US staff had a full-on revolt against it and put together their own editorial that said we completely categorically um, object to the transphobic language of the Guardian, et cetera. It was, it was really fascinating to see. It seems to me, based here, that there's a lot of heat still in the debate in the UK, but it seems a little bit healthier. There are more, there are more views that are allowed, whereas it seems if you deviate from an orthodoxy at all in the States, then you're beyond the pale. Um, do, do you see that? I see that, again, recognising what you said earlier, that in certain um, sort of political bubbles, it's perfectly acceptable to raise doubts about um, males in women's sport in the States. But yes, in terms of like the kind of, um, the I don't know what you call them, the New York Times, New York Review of Books style um, contingent, they are very far away, it seems to me, from being able to talk about this responsibly or honestly, and everything seems so much more uh, polarised for reasons, I'm sure, that aren't just to do with this debate, but are to do with um, conditions in America more generally. But um, I think what gets missed in in American attempts to, I've met, I've read many a, a, a embarrassing op-ed trying to explain what's going on in Turf Island. You know, how can it be that these Labour voting, left-wing socialist women, middle-aged women have suddenly turned into these terrible bigots? Um, well, you know, we haven't. <laughs> but for one thing, in Britain, we have gender reassignment as a protected characteristic in our Equality Act. And I don't know, I um, certainly wouldn't really associate with anyone who wanted to roll that back. So it's not, in Britain, it's not an argument about should trans people have any legal protections, because they already do. And most of us are fine with those. It's about whether we change the basis of those protections from a process that's behavioural and observable and um, can be tracked through doctors and psychologists and a panel that sort of gives out certificates, or whether it turns into a matter of self-declaration based on an inner feeling, which had with no sort of further commitments about whether you, you know, what you do with your body after that. Um, so that gets missed because in America they don't have gender reassignment as a protected characteristic. And now there is, I think, as I understand it, a move towards protecting gender identity under Title IX, for instance. Um, and it's you know, when when the ramifications of that get realized by most people in America, which they still don't realize, I think there's going to be big trouble <laughs> because it puts gender identity, protecting gender identity puts you in a head-on confrontation with protecting sex. And yet American legislators seem to be trying to squeeze both of those things together and saying there won't be a problem. And there will because males have female gender identities and that and and are making and sort of females have male gender identities and they are making claims on the basis of those of identities as to where they should go in space or social space or sport or which drugs they should have access to and so on so that's going to affect the women in those spaces or the men in those spaces it's going to have an effect on them too So all of that nuance is getting mixed, missed because it's not being reported except in these sort of hugely emotional terms, propagandistic kind of terms about very vulnerable people who really need these protections without thinking through what they might, what consequences they might have for everyone else. And one of the most fascinating parts of the conversation has been this shift and this this kind of growing controversy and rift within the LGBT community. You're one of the, um, you're a member of, are you a director of LGB I'm Alliance? A trustee, a trustee of the charity. Trustee. The LGB Alliance, yeah. So is there a similar, we'll, we'll kind of explain what that what that is in a second, but is there a similar organization in the States? Well, there is an LGB Alliance US, I believe. I mean, it's a grassroots organisation. So we've only just got charity commission status in the UK that gives us some kind of legitimacy in terms of um, the establishment. But I don't think the US branch is anywhere near that. But there are, there's a grassroots organisation. And then 
Is there another one? I mean, there's 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 radical feminist organizations in the States who are heavily, have a heavy presence of lesbians amongst them, but I don't know that, and they are talking about this effect on lesbians in particular, but I think maybe there isn't a dedicated body to yeah. um, look after this. Because that seems like a really fascinating development. We've had some of the original founders of some of the LGBT charities like Stonewall, um, criticizing the current kind of their current trajectory. We still the LGB Alliance, which is obviously lesbian, gay, bisexual alliance without the trans. Mm -hmm. Can you outline kind of what that what the division is inside the the kind of the LGBT community around this ideology? Sure. So um, LG and B are all united in so far as they are united by sexual orientation understood in terms of biological sex. So your sex plus the sex of the people you tend to be attracted to. Um, if you're heterosexual, these will be opposite. If you're, if you're gay or lesbian, they'll be same. And if you're bi, it'll be both. And then the addition of the T, <laughs> I mean, obviously to be clear, just to say that the LGB should organize together separate from trans people is not to say that trans people shouldn't organize themselves politically and should should be represented politically of course they should it's about whether this is a natural or reasonable grouping trans people are not trans because of a sexual orientation um and so that's already i mean some of them are gay i would say you know same sex attracted people and some of them aren't some of them are heterosexual people quite a lot of them are heterosexual people so so really the, there's an uneasy kind of alliance there anyway in terms of like why exactly this is supposed to be the fit. But once it is the fit, um, and now the, the sort of, the, the umbrella is LGBT. In fact, in America, as far as I can see, it's like LBGT, Q plus I, you know, they've got intersex people in here. It's, that's, that's preposterous. <laughs> you know, it's just a big uh, asexual people. There's just, it's just getting more and more ridiculous but even if you just look at lgbt um the trouble again is that interests can conflict in this group and the most obvious one there's two obvious ones one is that some trans women say they're lesbians so they are i think you know they are males they're biologically male um and they're heterosexual they're attracted consistently to females but because their own identity is as a female they also identify as a lesbian. So organizations like Stonewall and GLAD have now re redefined sexual orientation as an identity. It's not a fact about you anymore, it's a feeling. And it, you know, you can, be a, you can be a lesbian even though you've got a penis. <laughs> I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it's, this is what is being said. Now that has actual consequences for lesbians. And it has obvious consequences for young lesbians in these queer, you know, what's called queer communities. They're always called communities. I don't think they're really communities um, where there are males saying I'm a lesbian, too. And if you exclude me from your dating pool in principle, then you are transphobic. Now, people really, straight people listening really need to think about what that is. It's a gay woman, a lesbian woman who is not attracted to males being made to feel as if she should be a certain kind of male because um, this is a lesbian too, allegedly. Now that is going to mess with your head, particularly in a world in which it's quite difficult to come out as a lesbian in the first place. So we have testimonies from detransitioners, that is um, young women who used to identify as men that when they were in this sort of queer community um as particularly as teenagers there was all sorts of kind of shady stuff going on you know the boundaries were getting blurred about and they didn't seem to feel they had the right to say i'm sorry i'm not attracted to males so that's one area of problems and the other area that seems to me very problematic is in terms of again younger people um trying to interpret their own sexuality and maybe misinterpreting that as a gender identity issue. So um, amongst the growing number of children and teens who are being referred to gender identity disorder clinics and quite often being given drugs, 
there's a high number of lesbians, like a disproportionate number of lesbians. There's also a disproportionate number of autistic children. And so, you know, in some cases, a gay a, a girl who fancies other women, who fancies girls, is thinking, am I a straight man? <laughs> you know, and it's, again, it just, to people who have not heard about this, they just, I, I can see why you might be incredulous. It just seems so strange, but I can assure you it is happening. And um, it, it's not right, <laughs> because the consequence, of course, is potentially double mastectomy at the age of 20 or puberty blockers which retard your sexual development and mean you can never really have a proper sexual life or worse. So there are big consequences if we get this wrong um, and I think we're getting it wrong. Mm. Yeah something that Katie Herzog talks about the and I've heard anecdotally a lot of um, people saying that there don't seem to be many butch lesbians anymore. It sort of seems to be a lot of trans, all the butch lesbians in the past now seem to be self-declaring de as trans men. I think that, I mean, I believe Katie and I've heard many lesbians say it. I think it might be worse in America than it is in the UK, but it, I, I can see why it's true um, that because there's so few butch lesbian role models on telly or in the media, you know, it's not a category that really gets talked about very much as an explicitly positive thing. Um, and then there is now a sort of fashion trend for being non-binary or trans. So if that's available to you, and if you're a girl hitting puberty and your body doesn't fit the norms, um, perhaps you fancy girls as well, you know, and you'd look around for people that look like you and act like you and are proudly out, um, you won't find as many as you used to. Well, if you ever did, actually, I don't think you ever did. I think that's a really, dis uh, it's not very well represented part of the um, LGBT spectrum. I mean, this is the problem, that if you put all these different categories together, then um, some categories will disappear. And if you look through some, a sociologist I know, Michael Biggs, has looked through the annual reports of GLAAD and Stonewall over tracking the, the number of times lesbian gets mentioned and the number of times trans gets mentioned over like several years. And you will not be surprised to find <laughs> that trans becomes more and more and more dominant in these reports and their projects and their um, goals and lesbian just disappears. So. And how would you how would you steel man the oppo opposing argument? Mm, which bit, which about what? Well, I guess, I guess the other side of, um, of the, the argument, you, you've said that um, the idea that you can change biological sex is a fiction. Okay. Some people would say that is transphobic. How would you steel man that side of the argument? Man, I find it quite hard to do because I really do find the, the, the challenge here is not an intellectual one. <laughs> the challenge is in having the guts to, to say what you think, to be honest. It's not a sophisticated line of attack. So, the, for instance, you cannot change sex, I would say, in response, there's sort of standard moves made against me. Um, one is that suddenly um, we're pointed to the existence of intersex people. And Anne Fausto Sterling is usually mentioned at this point, and somebody says, well, 1.7% of the population is actually intersex, did you know? Well, that's not true. <laughs> that's based on a, a really um, overly demanding conception of what it would be to be not intersex, according to which you would basically be fit the platonic ideal where you would have absolutely everything um, standardly in place. Now, most people aren't, a lot of people aren't like that. I'm not like that, to be honest. As I say in my book, I've had an ovary removed, so that would make me intersex, but obviously I'm not. So once you get a more realistic conception of what intersex is, and you're talking about, you know, 0.002, I think, percent of the population, but anyway, a very small number of the population genuinely having ambiguity, Okay, so we've established these people exist. Okay, how does this affect trans people? What is the next move supposed to be? Now, now we know that the vast majority of people fall into male or female, and then there are a very small number of people who 
regrettably, you know, for them, hard to categorize. They face all sorts of traumatic surger- surgical interventions potentially, and they have political interests of their own. But it's in no way helpful to intersex people to be lumped with genetically chromosomally standard people with a female gender identity. That's just two completely different things. So, so no one really successfully explains, even if we were, you know, if there were many more intersex people than we thought, how this would affect the trans issue, which is really not about your body, we are constantly told at all. So that's one. And then, I mean, the other big sort of intellectual giant here is the is the Judith Butler line, you know, the post-structuralist line that all sex, sex is a social construct, biology is a social construct, all of it's a construct, everything's a construct, you know, science is a construct. But that's going to take away far more than sex. <laughs> you know, it's going to take away pretty much all of our scientific understanding. And I don't really think that most people who who um, talk about gender identity are willing to go that far. So, yeah, I'm afraid I can't steal men the um, the argument against sex. I just think they're not very good, but I do try. So I go in my, in chapter two of my book, I go through various different kinds of arguments against me and say why I think then they don't work. Yeah. And just returning to the, the Laurel Hubbard story at the moment, because I think that, that also obviously created the, the Guardian um, editorial in response and seems to have cut through quite a bit with people and what what I also find interesting there is that there there was there seems to be a case of sort of shifting goalposts because for a while the argument was to do with uh, testosterone and as long as the uh, trans athletes had a lower testosterone then that was okay but then now scientific evidence have come out showing that a lot of the uh, as kind of it seems obvious a lot of the the muscle mass that's put on during puberty is maintained and is is continued but it doesn't seem to have changed the argument like the argument seemed to shift quite a lot on on the other side of the debate well yes yeah, so as you say um the male puberty confers many advantages in terms of muscle mass but also uh lung capacity twitch muscles limb length <laughs> wingspan um and all sorts of things that will not be reversed if your testosterone is reduced artificially. And actually, even if your testosterone, you know, if even if as a male, you reduce your testosterone to the levels required by the International Olympic Committee, you're still going to be, I think, six to 12 times higher than a woman on average in terms of testosterone. Um, meanwhile, at the, so that's at the elite level, but at the amateur level, many, many clubs and professional associations are not even requiring a reduction in testosterone. They're saying gender identity is enough. So if you identify as a woman, you should be in the women's rugby team. Now that is a big problem for women players. It's the most obvious example you can think of because it's a contact sport and big, heavy, strong bodies coming at you fast will kill you (laughs) eventually. So um, yeah, why aren't the arguments changing? Partly, I suspect, because um, no, you know, the powers that be in, in sport do not care about women's sport. That, I mean, it, it has been reported to me that that's true, and I see this as highly suspicious <laughs> uh, um, in that light, because, you know, the assumption seems to be, oh, well, it's just women's sport. What does it really matter anyway? But of course, it matters to women, and it matters to women who are not getting onto the podium because... Laurel Hubbard has decided to compete against them age 43. Um, That means that some women, women of color in New Zealand will not get to the Olympics because Laurel Hubbard did that. So it matters to them. Um, And I've read, again, I've read such terrible defenses of this. Like there's a sport, the um, correspondent in sport for the independent Jonathan Liu I quote him in in my book and he just sort of says look can't we just give trans women this <laughs> don't they deserve it for everything else they go through again this sort of hyperbolized projected fantasized version of like the most vulnerable person in the world 
on the podium getting a gold medal in some sort of compensatory act for all the things that they go through. That's, you know, we, we just lost, lost, we're off orbiting the planet somewhere at this point. That's not what sport's about. It's not like some kind of character reference or recognition for things you go through elsewhere in your life. It should be about how you perform in your group against people genetically um, similar to you in terms of their capacities. So, yeah, I don't know if that was a, that was a bit of a rambling answer, but. No, I mean, like the, the counterpoint is that don't uh, trans women have the right to compete. Well, rights talk in this area has just gone mad. I mean, we really need to go back and say, what on earth would that right be? <laughs> on what basis would it be? I mean, my whole point is that you don't generate rights by feeling that you are really a woman, though you apparently look like a man. You don't generate rights that way. I mean, I understand rights to be to to really relate to to needs or something like that, or or certainly maybe there is a in abstract a need there, but then it has to be balanced against other people's needs, and it will destroy women's sport if we carry down this route. Um, it will certainly dis destroy some women's sports and some teams and some competitions, and it may even get worse because we just can't say what's going to happen. So the, I think a, a lot of the um, complacency here is just assuming that there just won't be that many trans women identifying into women's sports. But I see no reason to think that. I mean, how do they know? Mm. Can you sort of summarise, as someone who's been in this conversation for so long, how you think things are shifting, like from two years ago, three years ago? Are you hopeful now? I mean, we we, we started talking about some of the things that have happened recently, but do you where do you sense that the conversations at? Well, I'm in the UK. We've got quite a, we've had some legal initiatives that have really helped clarify things. Um, one is the Kira Bell puberty blocker case, which is actually. Um, being appealed at the moment but the last time it came to court um, it was established that um, there were there were major obstacles to assuming that minors can consent to um, puberty blockers um, which is just 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 to interject which perhaps is another defining or differentiating factor with the US because the mm. fact that healthcare is a public yes. thing in the UK because of the NHS mm. means that those kind of like those kind of judgments seem possible because in some way we're all involved in those decisions we're all paying for those decisions whereas the fact that healthcare is largely private in the US brings in all sorts of other concerns like how much of the the drive towards medicalization is driven by other factors like profit, how much of it is driven by, like there isn't this sort of sense of a public uh, or a wider societal cultural decision being made in these things. I mean, I find that another interesting yeah, differentiating that's point. exactly right. And um, there's also in the last year or so, um, out the body that oversees NHS um, guidelines in particular areas it's called nice i can't remember what it stands for but anyway that's the abbreviation is NICE. national institute for clinical excellence right thank you well they have announced um an uh, i don't know what call a study a project an investigation into children and gender identity uh, disorder and the treatments given so that's very encouraging yes whereas in the states my uh one of my friends was telling me um you know, that she became across a surgeon advertising double mastectomies to teenagers on TikTok, you know. So the, the sort of commercialization element, the and of course this is highly marketable because the, the, the background idea is that everybody's got their sort of unique configuration of gender. And so you can then monetize that and you, if you can persuade young people that they should have major alterations to their bodies, then that's going to make somebody some money. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm i horrified every time I hear from um, or about uh, the surgeons in the US that are making their 
their careers out of this. I, the things they say, I mean, there's one woman, Joanna Olson Kennedy is on record as saying that if you, um, if you get rid of your breasts and you regret it, you come to regret it, you can just go and get another pair. So, I mean, there's a recording of her saying that. Obviously they're not going to be the same. <laughs> yeah, I don't know to spell this out to your audience, but they're not going to be the same. So, um, and breastfeeding for instance, will not be possible. So um, yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah, no, I interrupted you when when I asked you kind of how things had shifted and you mentioned the Kira Bell case. And... I was going to talk about the Maya Forstadter one as well. That's happened in yeah. the last few weeks. Um, Maya Forstadter um, tweeted some things. She was working for a, a think tank, an American think tank. <laughs> um, and uh, she tweeted some things about people not being able to change sex and that there were problems around uh, gender identity ideology being brought into policy and law and she lost her contract. Um, she then went to tribunal, employment tribunal, and bizarrely, this, this is quite well known because this is when JK Rowling got involved, but bizarrely the judge ruled that her belief that sex was immutable was not protected as a philosophical belief under the Equality Act. That we have a category of protected beliefs, religious and philosophical beliefs, but this was not one of them because it was not this belief that sex was immutable, the judge said was not worthy of respect in a democratic society. So, um, which is the test that you're supposed to, to meet. So that was a very, very shocking moment for me and for lots of other people, including JK Rowling, but that, she, Maya Forstadter then appealed and won. So that has just happened. So now it is set in, there's a precedent anyway, in employment law that you can say things like I've been saying and not be sacked. So that's very reassuring and has given a lot of women, I think in particular, some courage to be able to talk about what they think, um, which again, should open up the conversation a bit. And have you been in, because one of one of the issues here is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of dialogue across the different camps. I mean, obviously on one camp, if there's a belief that any kind of dialogue is literal violence, then it's very difficult to get beyond that. But have you had those conversations? Are there Are there people who are open to those conversations? There's certainly people that will do it privately. I've had private conversations with people who are trans activists really, who are quite high up in trans activist organizations. Uh, we don't agree, but we can get on. Um, but it was acknowledged at the time that they could possibly say that they were talking to me. Um, and whenever it comes to some sort of more public occasion, like um, a debate, somebody says to me, oh, it'd be really, in fact, students at my own university, it'd be great if we could have a, a debate with you and someone who disagrees with you, but no, you know, you can't, they could not find anyone that would sit on the platform uh, with me. Um, and that's a problem also in the media because quite often the trans activist organizations like Stonewall just won't appear next to someone like me, which means then the producers won't run the piece. So we just don't get that opportunity for public discussion. Um, but yes, I do, and I, I, it's always important to stress as well that there's a huge number of trans people who really don't want to become politically active or visible, but are very, very disconcerted about the um, extreme demands being made on their behalf that they don't even want. You know, so gender identity is not really a big concept for a transsexual who's had a full um, bodily transition and is living as the opposite sex. They don't think it's their gender identity that makes them what they are. They think it's the fact they went through this quite painful, radical, surgical um, event. So, uh, again, we just need to resist all these attempts to make everything seem simple and to make trans people seem as if they're just a hive mind, because they're not. You've just published this book. What's your hopes for it? Well, I hope it gets read not just by people that think I'm right already, but by people that think I'm wrong. I really, just for the sake of invigoration of the, the public discourse, you know, I've tried to take on as many talking points 
as I can in a clear way. You know, the things about intersex, um, the thing about Judith Butler, the thing about, um, you know, the many straw men that come up about sports. I've tried to deal with them, explain them, say why they're wrong. And now I want to know what people think, you know, and I want people to argue with me. Um, I'd love to know what um, people like ContraPoints or um, anyone else uh, who's interested in this stuff thinks about my arguments. We can have a discussion. I, I would love to debate with people. I'm always here if anyone wants to debate with me about it um, because you've got to move things on a bit. They're really very stuck. Um, we've got to, I think, observe the norms of intellectual inquiry in this area. Good luck. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.